The Baron is insolvent, and he's not big on ideas. His daughter, sad to say, will be a burden all her years. So what's the big idea with Cinderella Goes All Inclusive? Well, it's a version of Cinderella that works with an actor who uses a wheelchair playing the title role. And I've tried to enhance diversity with some of the other characters too. The conventional telling doesn't suit a wheelchair Cinderella for two key reasons. Firstly, Cinderella usually has at least two rapid costume changes. Once when transformed from serving wench garb into ballroom finery. Another when midnight strikes and the magic runs out. The actor is usually dashing off stage to the changing area during these moments, while fairy godmother antics are distracting the audience. Very tricky to replicate with a wheelchair in the equation. Secondly, trying to identify the ballroom SKP by her discarded footwear only makes sense if she's an anonymous girl amongst so many others. If she's the only girl in a wheelchair, that piece of the narrative becomes redundant. In rewriting it, I've tried to make the staging so simple that a production would even work in a typical village hall setting with no step-free access to the performing area. So it's inclusive in allowing a wheelchair user to play Cinderella, even in amateur theatre. But I have two fine girls, and with a title on our side, they're sure to find a handsome prince to take them for a bride. Then we have the catty stepsisters. In my version, they offer genuine competition for the prince's affections. They're slightly gender mysterious. They could be played by women, or by men who can present as feminine, or by any gender designation, providing the performer can play fabulous. If it were me seeking a cast, I'd hope to have some actors with gender variants in the mix. It would be silly not to. And thirdly, amongst the ten principles are four characters written for older actors. Baron, Baroness, Dame Shu, and General Attorney Nitpicker. Three of these for females. As for colour, I think that particular element has less to do with the structure of the story. Any panto can feature non-white actors. I've always tried to include more satisfying roles for women in my pantomime writing. Female characters who get some laughs and help drive the plot. In Goldilocks Bears All, the heroine is explicitly intended to be played by a larger actor, because there are people out there with a flair for performing who don't fit the Disney princess archetype. I don't recall the exact moment when I lost my mind entirely and said let's have the main character in a wheelchair, but it could have been my many years working as a traffic engineer designing wheelchair-friendly bus stops that finally bled through into my writing. Whenever I take to another urchin, I always nickname them after shoes in Jack's honour. There was a stubborn one, mule, the lazy one, loafer, those twins that broke into houses, they were a right pair of sneakers. Oh, and not forgetting the infamous coffee shop poisoner, the deadly mocker. Sin. It's funny. I can't seem to remember what became of Winkle Picker. Never mind what became of Winkle Picker. Who is this script for? I didn't want to create a role like this, but see it only accessible for a performer who'd already broken into professional acting. I wanted it to be a viable project for any amateur drama group who either had a suitable candidate already in their ranks, or who were determined to accept the challenge and say, let's go out and find one. So who's it for? Hopefully it's for anyone. Uh, this one here is Ruby, a luscious redhead. She looks a little unconventional. How does she identify? She identifies as fabulous, sire. Yes, but which box does she tick? She ticks all the boxes, sire. It says she describes herself as bisensual. What does that mean? It means when you buy her things, she becomes sensual. Family background is important too. I want to know what it says under relations. It says yes, please. Striking the correct tone is always an interesting balancing act for a pantomime writer. I'm one who leans towards being more risque and then tries to rein himself back in when he realises that's a bit too near the knuckle. In this version, we have the same scenario as a traditional tale. A young girl surrounded by hostile family members, but now she's in a wheelchair. So we have a decision. Do the Baroness and her daughters tiptoe around the disability? Or do they go all in? For me, they had to go all in. And if you're cutting loose with that kind of stuff, I don't see the point of being too timid with the innuendo either. So as I'm writing this script, how do I justify to myself, as someone who doesn't use a wheelchair, letting the antagonists take some cheap shots at Cinderella? Well, I justify it by having made her the most relatable, nuanced, astute, alluring, empathetic character I have ever put in a pantomime, who just happens to be in a wheelchair. I suppose I get to be umpire again, do I? Well, you do come with your own chair. We're all equal these days, Cinderella. And that means even if you do mooch about in a wheelchair, it's still okay to laugh at you. I think you mean with. Fine. 
Even if you do mooch about with a wheelchair, it's still okay to laugh at you. Unbelievable. I wouldn't be the only fairly obscure pantomime writer out there who ever finished a script, was really proud of it, got it published, and then thought, oh, I hope one day someone will actually perform this. I'm driven to at least try to spread the word because I think the inertia of the status quo will naturally tend to work against this script. Many amateur groups, if they do happen to stumble across this title, are likely to think, well, we've never had an actor in a wheelchair in our group, so it's a non-starter. Yet within that same community, there could be wheelchair users who'd love to give acting in local panto a try, if only they thought there was a role for them. And if they never get to hear about it, how'd they even know to ask? My instinct is that being able to declare your show the first ever wheelchair Cinderella, or the first amateur production, or the first outside London, would bring with it a certain degree of novelty and cachet and media interest that might do a lot of your promotional work for you. But until a production is up and running, the concept falls short of being truly newsworthy. Oh, and don't imagine, by the way, that an audience will be politely applauding along, thinking, what a worthy endeavour this is, almost as good as a regular Cinderella, in a manner that your cast might find condescending. Everyone knows a classic story inside out. Well, this one is so distinct from it that I've had to omit from these excerpts almost everything from Act 2, just to avoid major spoilers. So anyone who's watching this show for the first time should be so caught up in the twists and turns of the story, they won't have any attention to spare for thinking about the gender or disability status of the actors. We're a great team, see. Jade has a head for turning figures, and I have a figure for turning heads, and a personality for turning milk. I'm hoping the excerpts will give people a flavour of the script, but I'd love to create a more polished version using actors' voices. For that, I really should start with finding a wheelchair user who wants to unleash their inner Cinderella, starting by contributing their voice to these excerpts. It wouldn't require much more time and gadgetry than emailing me an MP3 of the lines you recorded on a phone. So if that's you, please do get in touch to discuss it. Thank you. I'm Baroness, and some might think me villain of the peace. Yet whose great schemes but mine will see the family's worth increase? The Baron is insolvent, and he's not big on ideas. His daughter, sad to say, will be a burden all her years. But I have two fine girls, and with a title on our side. They're sure to find a handsome prince, to take them for a bride. To find a widowed Baron, I'll admit, was quite propitious. The death of hubby one was ruled entirely non-suspicious. That wood-chipping machine of his was old and temperamental, just like the ancient Dalt himself, whose trip was accidental. I kept the family name Shu due to my lineage of famous bakers. Ah, Shu as in pastry. So your dad wasn't into leather? Not professionally, but it did seem apt, me falling for a man in Jack's line of business, he was the finest fella you'd find for fixing failing footwear. Absolutely superb. Superb? A beacon of brilliance bestride in his boot-binding band of brothers. Cobblers? Have it your way. But in any case, whenever I take to another urchin, I always nickname them after shoes in Jack's honour. There was a stubborn one. Mule. The lazy one. Loafer. Those twins that broke into houses. They were a right pair of sneakers. Oh! And not forgetting the infamous coffee shop poisoner, the deadly mocker sin. It's funny, I can't seem to remember what became of Winkle Picker. Never mind what became of Winkle Picker. Well, I'd better get on. I've got a new sketch to do for Ruby. Not another one of her in that tennis dress scratching her rear end. It's for the Poppy Dog collection. Ravishing Ruby stroking her schnauzer. I've not heard it called that before. But if I can't keep up with the workload, stepmother is sure to beat me. That awful woman. You should stand up to her. I can't stand up to her. My legs don't work. You shouldn't let her push you around. I literally can't stop her pushing me around. Not since she smashed a break off this chair with a rolling pin. I heard quite a lot of squeaking coming from your chair earlier, so I've dug out the lubricating oil. I didn't want you getting stranded out here. The chair's fine, folks. I think it's two days being allowed nothing to eat but cold turnip stew that's causing the squeaking. Hey, we all do it. Get over yourselves. This dispenser's a bit erratic, though. There, that sorted it. Yes, well done. Cancel the recovery truck. 
On the subject of drawing attention, what's happened to your favourite top? It seems to have developed a bit of a plunging neckline. My stepsister saw me warming myself by the kitchen range and decided to move me, lest I become a fire hazard. They were so eager to get me to safety, they nearly ripped my whole outfit right off me. There's an image. Honestly, what a pair, eh? I should go go. I tried sewing on this patch to cover the worst of the damage, but it's hardly going to fool anyone. It's obvious that everything underneath is all bust. There's no arguing with that. We head to the finest hall in the county, sire, to meet a pair of very interesting candidates. Ravishing Ruby and Juicy Jade. You were rather taken with their face scroll profiles, remember? Uh, this one here is Ruby, a luscious redhead. Very striking. She looks a little unconventional. How does she identify? She identifies as fabulous, sire. Yes, but which box does she tick? She ticks all the boxes, sire. I've always liked the womanly sort, as you know. Is she womanly? It says she describes herself as bisensual. What does that mean? It means when you buy her things, she becomes sensual. And her younger sister Jade is described as trisensual. Meaning, she'll try anything sensual. Well, an adventurous spirit can be a nice counterpoint to maidenly purity. I trust they are both maidens. They are now, sire. Sorry. Shall we move on? Hang on. What did you just say when I asked if they were maidens? I said they are. And then I said, now, sire. Shall we move on? Family background is important too. I want to know what it says under relations. It says yes, please. Next to type, it appears to say fluid. I think they're both water signs, sire. Pisces and Aquarius. Are you sure they're definitely both looking for a man? They're even more focused than that, sire. They're looking explicitly for a prince. We are to invite your favourite back to meet your grandmother, advancing you swiftly from bachelorhood into the loving embrace of your royal bride. Couldn't I just hold one of my balls? That sounds like more of a temporary solution, your highness. My role is to stop you from doing or saying anything improper. Like what? Like anything reckless or feckless, or slanderous or scandalous, or reprehensible or indefensible, or discriminating or self-incriminating, or fallacious or salacious, or attackable or non-take-backable. I don't even know what half of those things mean. Which is why you need to be followed around by someone who does know what they mean, who can stop you from doing or saying them. Those are mine. You've been helping yourself to my iconic designer eyewear. Well spotted. But for the purpose of this mission, as I'm pretending to be you, there'll be the iconic designer eyewear, eyewear. You're being his bodyguard, Perkins, a no-nonsense headcracker. Is this fast your idea, Dandini? I shall break your stupid head open. See how quickly it gets into character. Marvellous. I suppose I get to be umpire again, do I? Well, you do come with your own chair. If your outlook was a little more inclusive, you'd let me play. You can play, Cinderella, but you're in the invalid category. You just need to find the necessary sports equipment and attire, and then a fellow mobile seat enthusiast. Mobile seat enthusiast? Where am I going to find another wheelchair user? I have personally volunteered to break buttons and kneecaps on more than one occasion, but Mumsy has forbidden it. That's suspiciously compassionate of her. She doesn't want to degrade the quality of my grovelling. We're all equal these days, Cinderella. Are we? Yes. And that means even if you do mooch about in a wheelchair, it's still okay to laugh at you. I think you mean with? Fine. Even if you do mooch about with a wheelchair, it's still okay to laugh at you. Unbelievable. We're a great team, see. Jade has a head for turning figures, and I have a figure for turning heads and a personality for turning milk. This little beauty could have been made for me. Tough, flat-headed, and very highly strung. A bat fit for a champion. 200 pounds worth of pure graphite precision. If we're being precise, I think you'll find it's a racket. Yes, at that price it probably is a racket, but hey-ho. Why do you call me Button, sir? Times got hard about 12 years back, after Cinderella's poor mother died. Cinderella was seven, you were barely eight. Well, when all the others said they would leave him because they couldn't work any longer for coppers, you stood up and declared, I'll work for buttons. So what did everyone call me before that? Chimney sweep number four. Very affectionate. We never have visitors. Who's coming? Never you mind. Ruby wants a new sketch. One of Chewy chewing Chase's tail. I think it was the other way round. 
Fine then, Chase chewing Chewy's tail. That's half right, but still the wrong way round? Chewy's tail chewing Chase, is she mad? No, what she wants is Chase chasing Chewy's tail. What did I say? Chase chewing Chewy's tail. Well, whichever, just do it. Oh, and Cinderella, hold out your hand, not the one you draw with. I draw with both of them. It's the only way I can keep up with the work. Such a sly little thing, aren't you? I've never been a man who minds answering his own door, you see. It's mostly the local peasantry mind knocking up my daughter. Sorry? I find the commoners like to rat-a-tat-tat, -tat, though. More deferential. Prefer to leave the bells for their betters and go straight for the knockers. Er, uh, right. What a clang you gave it, though, sire. Rang on and on. Never known such appeal. He's certainly not short on appeal. Majestic effort. I should have known it was His Highness seeking entry purely by the length of his dong. Delighted to meet you, Your Highness. I am known on face scroll as Ravishing Ruby. A little bit sporty, a little bit naughty, and always red hot on the dance floor. Enchanted to meet you, Your Highness. I am known on face scroll as Juicy Jade. Graceful good looks, smart with my books. On my side, the grass is always greener. Juicy Jade, eyes slightly wonky, teeth like a donkey. I am Ravishing Ruby. Fuzz in all places, breath worse than chases. Ruby! This gig is getting rougher than the Oscars. I did say she was striking. You keep my puppy's name out of your mouth! What the heck does that mean? No one talks about my puppies! Foolish girl, you've got 20,000 followers who talk about nothing else! But she's clearly a scandal waiting to happen. And she's got a left hook like Frank Bruno. I thought we didn't talk about Bruno. But grandmother will insist that the third daughter also comes to see her. Her name again? Cinderella? Uh, but even setting aside the practicalities, she's scarcely fit for such company. Grandmother will be interested in their outlook and accomplishments. She plays the piano, so perhaps a little singing. Uh, but surely there'll be steps. Steps? S Club 7, she loves the party classics. I mean stairs and such. Uh, she's hopelessly preoccupied with her sloping surfaces. Aren't all teenage girls? What's the big mystery? These are for you. They belong to your mother. Modest in value, I'd guess, but enough to get you a fresh start, perhaps. Then you could have sold off the sapphires yourself and made a new life somewhere. What stopped you? You did. I did. Seven years old. Stuck in a chair. Your mother gone. Your father losing his wits and his fortune. And there's you, more concerned with checking I had enough firewood than hankering after fine things. So, I knew you'd be the one to look after them. Try them on then, you ninny. A perfect fit. Thank you, Dame Shoe. Could you hold them on your lap while I sketch them? You're so worried about your stepmother, you won't even take them back to the house. She'd just take them off me just out of spite and still beat me for keeping secrets. Father would be oblivious and I'd carry on a slave forever. A slave who spent one day with a pretty pair of her mother's slippers on her feet. <laughs> I'm sorry. For three long years I've tried to win them over. I've tried to be brave for Buttons and for Father. But I, I don't know how to get rid of her. And I, and I don't know how much longer I can go on. You listen to me. Your mother watches over you from above, Cinderella, and down here, well, there's always me. Ah, sire. Have you now seen young Cinderella? Only from a distance. Granny's told me to stay out of the way. Close enough to see the nymph-like face? Close enough to see that she has wheels? A detail you seem to have withheld? Wheels won't stop her gliding down the aisle. They'll certainly make carrying her over the threshold a bit of a performance. The front door's 30 steps above the driveway. I believe she does fully detach from the chair, sir. It's a vehicle, not an appendage. Well, whatever. Mother wants you to study these sketches. Ah, this one's rather clever. The Baron's weed-clogged duck pond, as seen from the Tilting Greenhouse. I meant the reflection in the glass. Look, it's an off-centre self-portrait. Wow! She's stunning. She's angelic. This one here caught Granny's attention. Pauper holding sparkly slippers. Good heavens! 
if I'm not mistaken, scattered around them. That's the astral burst. A set of very fine diamonds, rumoured to have been inlaid into a pair of shoes years ago. So they might be sitting on a huge nest egg and not know it. All the better for us. If we nominate this modest curiosity for our dowry, we won't need Ruby's popularity, Jade's analysis or Cinderella's artwork. You can choose whichever of the three you prefer and still refill the palace coffers. I'd just like to marry someone I'm crazy about. And who's crazy about me? It seems like Grandmother would be happy marrying me off to an old slipper. In the case of Ruby, she'd be happy marrying me off to an old slapper.